Say hi, Kate. Greetings. Hi. <laughs> we, we were talking when we first got on about elk. You don't have any elk in your yard today. Not today. Or the neighbor chest them off. But, you know, I hope every day that they will come because they are gorgeous. I love, they were here first. I feel like they've got a right to the yard. Yeah, you live out, out as you described, in the boonies. So Kate is on her phone. Way. Yes. And I, uh, oddly I enough. I wouldn't start today. I got up at five to try and, and troubleshoot everything. But if it doesn't want to go, it doesn't want to go. And everybody's online now, right? So it's even harder to get online. And, and that's why I'm doing it at 6 a.m. my time. Because the internet starts to bog down at about 8 my time. Does it? And by 5 p.m., it is almost completely stopped. So I have to finish doing whatever I'm doing online by 5 p.m. I start at 2 in the morning, so that's not hard to only put in a 15-hour a, a day. And then watch some Stargate Atlantis for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm lining up Battlestar Galactica next. Okay, okay. <clears throat> we... Uh, because of where we live, we can't stream videos, probably like you. So I have all the DVDs and stuff like that. Okay, I see people popping up now. So I'm thinking we're live uh, and full on, not Memorex. Did you have those commercials in, in the UK? No. No, I don't I, know I what think, that is. Oh, Me Memorex were uh, uh, cassette tapes. Okay. And, yeah. and, they would play, and they would play like a concert. And... It would be, is it live or Memorex? That was their commercial. They recorded so cleanly on Memorex tapes that uh, you couldn't tell if it was live or not. And uh, so, yeah, old people like me will say, is it live or Memorex? And now you know. Inquiring minds want to know. So so Kate is here to talk about story, the power of that first chapter. Uh, as, as we were discussing earlier, KU, Kindle Unlimited, $10 a month. Readers, if they get turned off in your first chapter... They will put your book back, stop reading it, turn it in, and go get another one. And they can accomplish all of this in less than one minute from the comfort of their recliner in the living room. So you don't ever want to give somebody a reason to put your book down. So let's. how does that start? How, when you look at your first chapter, how do you know that it is killer? Um, so I, I believe that you do not have to dive into genre to work out what is killer. Um, I think that outside of any genre conversation, we can talk about what an opening hook looks like and how to write an opening hook. Uh, and one of the things that I did in the last week, I was trying to think about, you know, what can I do? And I'm technically inept and I don't know how to sell anything. I couldn't sell ice to an Eskimo, but I know story. So I started making these short videos. I asked for three volunteers um, and I lucked out. I totally lucked out. I got three outstanding writers who sent me their pages and I, I did what a developmental editor would do. <clears throat> I was a book coach and a developmental editor, a ghostwriter and all these things. Um, and so generally what you do as a book coach or as a developmental editor is you read through all the way. Um, and I asked only for first chapters. I did not want to see covers. I didn't want to see blurbs. I wanted to see whether or not it worked on the page. So on the page, the second somebody opens that, does that first sentence pull you in and make you read? Um, I the, the structure that I think is easiest for people to understand is Freytag's Triangle. Um, and I think that that is now slightly defunct. So the structure of Freytag's Triangle, probably everybody who's on here, this is really rudimentary stuff, and we're just going to be like revisiting little bits. Um, but there used to be in classical literature a period where you meet your character and there's a setup, there's ordinary life as you set up and you set up setting and you set up character before the inciting incident, which catapults them into action and starts everything going. And I think that that has changed. I think that has changed um, definitely for indies and probably for traditional writers as well. Um, the, and this is a, a slight genre conversation. When the inciting incident happens is going to depend on your genre. But for all of us, it's going to be way close to the beginning of the book. And the opening hook has to pull us in. You do not have time. Okay, no, no. You know what? I'm going to correct myself there. If you are writing some kind of literary fiction, 
where your readers are expecting a gentle lead in and they want to know about the color of the leaves on the trees and they understand that that's a symbolic moment and they they're willing to to wade in with you slowly maybe you can have a slow start i still don't believe that for for high literary fiction you know, I wanted to be Virginia Woolf for a while. I don't think that she could sell a book now, uh, even though they're fabulous. So the, the opening hook has to be something that absolutely grabs you. And if I can, I'm, can, I, can I read you some stuff and show you the difference? So these were the three pieces. Craig, you've got to say no if, if the answer is no. <clears throat> Well, and, and uh, this is this is when uh, when we made the post in 20 books of 50K, Indies Helping Indies, uh, Kate said, I don't do developmental editing anymore, but I'm willing to do this to help somebody out. First chapter, first three people to comment, and it's great that you got some uh, some great submissions. So, yeah, please, yeah. shoot. Yeah, I did. So, um, sorry. Oh, my God. Mm. <laughs> No, of course not. Of course not. Um, so so the, I, I printed them out and one of them didn't print because my computer is being a swear word. Um, so, so hang on, hang on uh, just a second. Uh, we need to say our disclaimer. There is swearing on this show. So put your children outside, keep your dog close and uh, turn the volume down or put on headphones. All right. Thank you. We'll continue. Yes. Uh, I will try to remember, and I know it matters to people, and it matters. Um, I write post-apocalyptic post science fiction, and my particular readers hate swearing. They think that it shows low intelligence. They think that it takes away from the story, and I, in real life, swear like a sailor. Um, you, you, you do. So it's, I, it's, uh, yeah. it's... <laughs> I have to switch that off um, when, when I am... Um, when I'm talking to real people. Um, so, so I got three pieces uh, and the first one started with the character in the trunk of a car that reeked of garlic. And that's just a fantastic opening. Absolutely fantastic because we've got an image. You always start with an image. Every book starts with an image and you want that image to be something that, that catches your reader um, the trunk of a car is a trope, right? It, it could come up in all kinds of different genres, um, but it could be any flavor of mystery. It could be any flavor of horror. It could be comedy, depending on what happened next, but it's not very likely. So this is someone who really, really understands how to use an image and then how to layer in some, some mystery. So they woke up in the trunk of a car how did they get there? Who put them there? And then it reeks of garlic. If it reeks of garlic, they're not talking about themselves, right? They're talking about their environment. Um, and so we already have this idea about somebody who has kidnapped them, somebody who has a cuisine that is heavy on the garlic. Um, so we already, in, in one sentence, she woke up in the trunk of a car, a car that reeked of garlic. Okay, we're in. We are absolutely in. We, we've got questions that we want answered. Um, and this is, the, this is how you set up your first chapter. And as I talked, um, Anne said she is going to catalogue the videos that I've made so far and put them. She's magical and knows where to put them and yeah. do technical things. So they'll be available to everybody if you want to go and look at some of these pieces. Um, so, so we're looking for a hook and we are looking, as Craig said, your, your people, when they look at your book, um, let's say your, your cover is on point, your cover is perfect. The people who are looking at those covers are like, whoa, that is a cool cover. That blurb, that blurb is pretty good. And then they start reading and, and you are leading them in gently. They can go to the next cool cover. They don't have to stay with you at all. So you need to grab them with your opening hook. So let me, uh, let me give you another example. Um, and I'm going to do this really quickly because I spent uh, five sessions on this piece. Really, all three of these writers um, were, are really accomplished. But the second two writers, what they did is what a lot of us do. They wrote themselves into the piece. Um, and I don't know if they're plotters or pantsers or plancers. I don't know how they write. Um, these were very, very well edited pieces. These obviously had gone through more than one pass. 
but they buried their hook. And lots of us do that. I would say probably most of us do that is the hook is somewhere in the first few paragraphs and you need to go back when you're editing and dig it out and get it up at the top. Um, so, so the second one we've got, Sophie McLaughlin took the concrete stairs from the train station at a brisk pace, her fingers skimming the cold metal handrail for safety. Late morning shoppers dodged in front of her, bringing her up short and hindering her progress. She huffed because tardiness on her first day was not a good look. Damn, she'd waited for... So I'm already out. I, I already am moving on to the next book um, because this is set up and the setup is slowing us down. She's doing something familiar, which is great, um, but she's doing something so familiar that there's nothing that tells us that the world is out of kilter. And the brain is looking for, in the first pages, the brain is looking for something's not right. And your readers are super sophisticated. They yep. really understand structure. Uh, they wouldn't know how to describe it to you. But if yeah. you if you run into um, a soggy middle, lots of people complain about having a soggy middle, right? A soggy second. Uh, yeah. That has to do with your structure has broken down and you don't understand something about structure. And this begins page one, sentence one. And as I carried on reading, it turns out that it's all in here. It's actually all in here. Um, she, she took the concrete stairs and then, it, you know, three paragraphs later, her knees buckled, she fell blindly forward, her grip yanked away from the rail, and she fell into Santa. So, so we've actually got what happens right at the beginning, but it's buried in the fourth paragraph. So if, you, if you've got set up that is slow, that is, um, I'm not going to say ponderous, because this isn't ponderous. Um, she's just doing something that is quite traditional, and I don't think that works in KU anymore. And I don't think that that works for a lot of writers, uh, readers. The third one, um, she did something similar. Um, she, <clears throat> she set up, it took us, yeah, it took us nearly half a page to get to the hook. Um, and so I would say when you're looking at your first page and we all write differently, I'm going to guess, Craig, that you write really clean and that you already know what a hook looks like and that you have got like punchy things. I mean, I imagine that you are probably even someone who dreams in hooks and like comes up with a cool sentence. It's like, that's the sentence, you know, he had his yeah. gun in the back of his pants. You, you already know that there's something that's going to lead you and you know where it's going to lead you. Um, I, I've heard you talk about not planning, but I think that's because you are a, a deeply knowledgeable writer. Is that right? You don't do you plan I, things I, out. Do you plot? I've read an awful lot of books, and I I, uh, I detail why I like them, and that's a, a mental review. My planning exists of uh, of getting it in my head. But you're exactly right. When those sentences hit me, and I'll I'll jot them down. Like uh, I yeah. finished book seven in one series. I'm not going to write book eight for another couple months. And uh, I still, I jumped over, I started the template on book eight and I wrote a couple sentences down that I had thought of in the previous book that didn't apply and, and put them there. And I actually write that first uh, page with the template. It takes like three minutes. I get a quick 500 words. Well, okay, 15 minutes and, and then put it away. So when I start this next book, I'm not starting. I'm already 500, 1,000 words in. And it really makes it so much easier. It gives me that flow because I read yesterday's work before starting today's and then move through. Let me let me read something for you here. Yes, yes. And this one, this one was the greatest non-hook. When I read it the first time, I'm like, what the fuck? This is a little slow and but everybody loves this book. So what the hell? My wife has uh, is is up to book six now, so I better start and read them. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Previat Drive, <laughs> were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. Right. And, and, and you go back now, knowing more of, uh, of why, and this is, I read this, you know, what, 10, 15 years, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, mm -hmm. that one, if you look at it, it would have sucked. But the thank you very much at the end was like, okay, now it's a challenge. They're normal. Mm -hmm. We're, we're demanding normal, and the title that's just above that is the chapter title, The Boy Who Lived. Mm -hmm. We're normal, 
and, and the chapter. So together, and this is where I only use chapter numbers now. I use titles and people are like, oh, you shouldn't use titles. And I'm like, and, and then I got them wrong because I put the title and then I typed the, the, the chapter and not go back and it had nothing to do with the chapter. And I got bagged on that a couple of times. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I should change that chapter title. But the, but that that first sentence and then the, the next couple sentences, they were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. <clears throat> so right there it says, okay, this is this is a middle grade, maybe a YA book, but it really isn't. It's uh, for all ages. But still, un understanding that and the depth of that engagement. So either uh, <clears throat> I expect J.K. Rowling is is probably 90, 99% responsible for that. But then also the editors, Scholastic's editors, uh, who, uh, who then took it, probably wickered it just enough to, to make it the home run that it became. Yeah, it's uh, so she's done this this fabulous thing with a, a negative impression, right? So so they're normal and they don't have truck with any of that kind of nonsense. And as you say, the the heading, the boy who lived, like wow, what does that mean? Who's trying to kill a boy? That's terrible. And then you've got these normal people and they live it on Privet Lane, right? Which is just this great English uh, boxed in kind of feeling. It's I think it's a great, great opening. I really, really like that opening. She understands what she's doing and she understands that the hook is pointing you in a direction, right? Because what? he's going to be fighting the Dursleys for a long time. And, and I, I like uh, in, the, in the military, we were always told, here's the five paragraph approach to anything you do. The first paragraph, tell them what you're going to tell them. The next three paragraphs, <laughs> you put your three points, tell them. And the final paragraph is tell them what you just told them. So it's the standard <laughs> five paragraph approach. And when I went to, uh, I, I went, I listed in the Marine Corps and like seven years yeah. later, I got selected to a commissioning program and they sent me to college. And uh, in college, I went through uh, uh, English because I had to get those credits because University of Arizona, those pricks, they wouldn't accept my, uh, my CLEP. So I CLEPed out of English. I took the test. I passed. I got my college credits, which they accepted the college credits. But the English per department said, no, you still have to take your classes here. And, and I did. I, mean, I took them there. Like it? Um, the English department, classes? the English department at the University of Arizona were such such a raging cockwombles that uh, <laughs> I. It's one of my favorite words. <laughs> I, I actually went over to I paid out of my pocket to go to the uh, uh, community college because they transferred directly. And I took English 101 and English 102 at the community college, got my credits. And I did not have to deal with that English department at UA. So yeah. that was. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think MFA programs are some of the death knells of, of so many writers because they. Um, so so my wife, we used to make films together um, and we would write and produce them. She would direct and then she would edit. Um, and she would occasionally she'd say, you know what, there is only one person who I will allow to frame fuck me when I'm editing. And I think the same is true for, for editing something <laughs> is, you know, cause you know, you get somebody coming in and they're like, no, 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 no. You want uh, eight tenths of a second taken off that. And it's like, you know what? Bullshit. I know what I'm doing. Back off. NFA programs were filled with so uh, they would have killed me. They absolutely would have killed me. I would have stopped writing um, because they're at the sentence level without telling you why. And Neil Gaiman has this great quote about um, a million writers can tell you that you're wrong and they'll be right. And they could tell you how to correct it and they'll be wrong. And I think that's probably true of most of your readers. They know when something's off, but they won't know how to fix it. Only you know how to fix it because you are inside that work. Um, <coughs> And, and the golden, so, so. the golden egg of the developmental editor, the good ones, that says this, and and even if you can point to, here's where it's bad, like the mm -hmm. the authors you were dealing with, like hey, the hook isn't in these first two paragraphs; it's buried. Put a hook up front, and then you can go into your world building and your background uh, and your description to set up the next scene. So, yep. just that little advice. I don't care what your hook is. You know your story, just you got to put it up front. Those kind, those right. ad, uh, bits of advice are gold. So thank you for doing that for, for our folks. When I'm, uh, oh, have you got other people lined up? Are we wrapping up? 
Oh, no, 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 not at all. We've been on for 10 minutes. Oh, 20 minutes. <laughs> Jeez. I got 40 more minutes, Kate. Don't be trying to f bail out on me. <laughs> I see an elk. Um, Gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> I do love them. Well, I can't see if anybody's typing. I can't see if anybody's with us. I can't see who's watching. I, you know, my, you, my computer it, typed out, so. Trust me, it's better that way. I could tell you we have thousands of people already online watching every move you make. Okay. Okay. And listening um, intently and recording every word you say. <laughs> Actually, we have we have fifty eight people watching right now. Do we? Do we? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, you know, I uh, I made some notes because I wanted to make sure that we hit on some um, some of the big things. So so every single chapter. First chapter, definitely, and these have to be really, really strong, but every chapter that you write, you need the following elements. You need an opening hook. You need um, a question answered. You need a question asked. You need rising tension, and you need a closing hook. Every yeah. single chapter, every chapter. Um, and, and, you know, you think about first chapters and you're like, what do you mean you have to have a question answered in a first chapter? The point is, when we come in, we don't come in before the action has started. We come in in media res. This person already has a life. They have a life that went on before you stepped in and you step in the second things start getting interesting. Um, and the the uh, I got a bunch of structure books out. I don't know if people because structure. Oh hi -ya. Completely, Yeah, no, he he's the boss man. I mean, you know, he he is scary, scary, brilliant. Um, and, I came and, from a screenwriting background, so um, Save the Cat, great yep. talks about how thinking in beats. I love Save the Cat. The thing is, everybody is right. You have to find out what's right for you. You have to find out what works for you. So these talk about different ways, and we're going to talk about structure, big picture structure, that goes back to Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces. So the, mm. this, is, this is the, um, the hero's journey. Okay, uh, you've okay. Got, you've got a character who wants something. They face an obstacle. They struggle. And then they succeed or fail. If they succeed, we're in comedy or drama. And if they fail, we're in tragedy. This is currently my favorite. Um, take off your pants and write because I'm a pantser. And I'm trying not to be a pantser because I need to up my production. Um, I wrote eight books last year. But I need to write more than that because um, I like <coughs> making money. I've got expensive dogs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this was – I'm not joking. I'm really not joking. Um, this was the absolute game changer for me, and we're going to talk about this today in some detail. Um, and Donald Mass, of course, we love Donald Mass. Um, really, really excellent. So, so I'm going to say that all of these people are right, and you should hunt and peck and look around and read heavily in your genre to find out what works for you. Um, and, and when you're looking at structure, big picture structure, any one of these guys can tell you what it is you're building. Um, I, tell me if I get lost in the weeds here because it, I don't know very much about house building, but I've had this running around in my head for a while. That structure, building the structure of a novel is like building a house. And it, it could be round. It could be pyramid shaped. It could be square with a door in the front and windows in the front, a roof. But we all recognize a domicile. It doesn't matter what the shape of it is, anything from a cottage to a castle, we recognize that that is a home of some kind. It keeps the heat in in the winter, it keeps the cooling in the summer, but it does the things that home is supposed to do and it's built a certain way. There are load-bearing beams, there's a roof of some kind to keep the water out, and structure for a novel is really, really similar to structure for a house. Um, there are going to be people, I'm just going to take a wild guess, um, having listened to Craig and Michael, who are both scary as fuck. I mean, so scary to be around. So scary. I adore them. I can barely speak to them because I just fangirl like mad and run away. Um, unless I'm drunk and then I sit and chat. Um, so, so, so when we were in Edinburgh, I made, it, I made it a point to go sit next to you. 
<laughs> I know because you're awesome. You are completely awesome, and I'm a nerd and a dork. <laughs> but um, but I'm gonna guess that they are both the kinds of writers who um, that they're they're almost one in a million who have read enough and thought enough and or they have that gene that that tells them this is what a story structure looks like and they can write the minute they start writing they're writing and they understand that 99% of us are not like that I am absolutely not like that you can meet writers who knew me 15 years ago who would say oh you know what I really loved her but she was writing gobbledygook. I didn't understand a word that she was writing because I've got so much going on in my head and I can go from A to F and I think B, C, D, E is all implied. So I just tell you <coughs> A and F and they're all looking at me like, what are you talking about? Um, and I had to study. I really had to study. I eventually took a novel writing class in the, and I've been writing for a long time by then writing and making money, making good money. Um, and I took a novel writing class at UCLA, which was a nine month non-resident um, class or no resident, you had to do one weekend in LA. Um, and the, what I did was there are 10 people in the class and everybody read everybody's stuff. You had to critique two people's stuff and the instructor critiqued your stuff. Um, but I read everybody's stuff and watched what she was saying to everyone and studied. And I realized, whoa, one, I've got to slow down because people don't jump from A to F. And I am an arrogant fuck thinking that I understand what an inciting incident is. And there are people who do. There are people who do, who land on the page and they understand what that is and they understand where it goes and they understand the difference between plot and story. And I was not one of those people. Uh, and I made a living writing. And when it came to writing my own books, I'd stall and there'd be, I, I could show you a pile that, you know, like <laughs> almost to the ceiling of, of how many drafts it was um, until I started to study. Uh, and and studying really, really basic stuff about what does, you know, you've got a character, the character has a desire, the desire has an obstacle, they struggle against it, they succeed or fail. And that's the most basic structure. Um, and I think I mentioned that for me, this was the game changer. This absolutely changed it. Um, and last year I put my own uh, series out and that, that was making six figures by the time three books were out. Because I got out of my own way, I studied, and I started to understand that, that no matter what the shape of it, you're writing a cozy mystery, you're in a cottage, that's what that structure looks like. You're writing epic fantasy, you're in a castle, that's what that looks like. But the building blocks for all of your stories are exactly the same. Plot is what happens story is why it matters to your character and when plot meets story then you can set up a cause and effect trajectory so pixar talks about this south park talks about this um, they talk about how you build um, and so and so and so the character makes a decision that makes something happen and because of what happens, they have to make another decision. And because of that decision, something else happens. So they have to make another. So everything is driven by the character. It is not, and then, and then, and then. It's not a series of things coming from the outside. It comes from the inside. Um, are you seeing any questions yet? Because I'm, I'm about to go. Oh, into oh you bet. You bet. And as I, I wanted to interject, but you were on a roll. So, uh. The, uh, I'm always on a roll, man. Put mustard it, on me. <laughs> when, when, if somebody's reading your work and they start yes. with uh, getting feedback on, uh, giving feedback on, hey, that's good world building, but, and 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 I see too many authors say, just keep reading. Too bad you've already lost reader because you don't get to tell every reader that you don't get to put a at the bottom of the uh, the page. Please just keep reading; it'll get better. <laughs> Well, no, make it good to begin with, and, and then you won't have that to put disclaimers on every page. Please keep reading. Uh, so, yeah, yeah don't, don't if that's your footer is just keep reading, then uh, you're you're going to lose them. But uh, let me uh, let's see. Uh, do we have a 
do we have a, a real question? No, I actually wanted to read another one. This is my favorite opening, as okay. bizarre as it is. And it has, it has 1,900 reviews on Amazon with an average 4.2 rating. And this is my favorite opening ever. Yep. It, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the <laughs> age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the ep epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. And it goes on. And it's one sentence, and it's like 98 words. But it, it's, it's a, a comparison. It's contrast. Season yeah. of light, season of darkness, best of times, worst of times. And the whole thing is uh, the whole novel it's what I said earlier. Tell them what you're going to tell them. I'm going to tell you why it was the best of times and it was the worst of times, taking a journey through these disparate characters. The second paragraph starts with, there was a king with a large jaw. <laughs> I, I mean... And a queen with a plain face. So uh, uh, it, it's... it's uh, but that's, but that's the second paragraph, so now we're getting into the character. Sets the hook. Yeah. Here, here's what I'm going to tell you in this whole book. And then you get to the end, and you're like, hey, irony. It was this dude. He was actually this dude. It wasn't a dude at all. And, and you're like, what, uh, what? What did I just read? And then you're kind of forced. <laughs> we, we read it in 10th or 11th grade in, in high school. So, But it's, it's uh, the, the hook has to happen in the first paragraph. And Absolutely. probably in the first, and if you can any way possible get it in the first sentence, yes. then that's where you have to put it. So yes. uh, let me, let, let's do a live review. I'm working on a short story right now. Let's see if my, uh, <clears throat> see if my, uh, my hook. Just shot through the roof. My adrenaline just went through. You're, you're ready to go. You're ready to go right here, live. Yes, I'm ready. It's okay. It's okay. The, uh, you told me not to ac that. Actually, I have a uh, section header for this one. It's called The Garden. Yep. Someone has been here, Delavinia said, using his thought voice. His small nose flittered as it looked for a scent. The meter-tall rabbit hop-walked to the next bush. He saw the footprint in the dirt, dirt, doom and pestilence on this human's head. Wow. Wow. Someone has been here is a fantastic opening. Fabulous. Because we don't know who's been here. Um, and I don't know what the creature is with a flittering nose, but I already like this creature. So this creature is already uh, this al is already sympathetic, and we need to separate out um, your character being one of the things I see with new writers a lot is like my character has to be likable. No, 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 no. Your character has to be relatable, and relatable yeah, yeah. means it has to have some kind of human emotion that we click into. And, and we've got pestilence here, we've got a flittering nose, we've got a footprint that we don't know where it came from, and someone has been here, there's invasion that has already happened. And it's very interesting that you've got the garden, because the garden sounds, okay, well, you know, your first thought is like, well, what kind of garden? But then there's got that like, biblical undertones of the garden, and the garden has already been invaded. There, there, it, someone has been here, that's great, that's great, because we want to know who has been here. Who has been here and what have they done? And and who's got this fucking flittering nose? I really want to know who they are. I like And it that is the whole rest of the story goes to who was there. Right. So so, so it, you, it, you've already set up probably the antagonist, right? So the antagonist is the person who was there. So your hook Yeah. The antagonist, the, the protagonist is not the rabbit. That's the the main mm. characters. This is it's a different group of, of talking animals and humans who can uh, communicate with telepathy. Okay, that, but this is this is a short story that follows nine previous books. So, but still, I wanted it as a I wanted it as a standalone. People will say, "Hey, I like this. Let's uh, let me yeah. get, let me see the backstory." Here, I got nine yeah. books of backstory. Come on in. <clears throat> awesome. But the, it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, one of those things you have to set that hook. You have to. Have I, I like action? I like action in the first uh, in the first uh, paragraph. I like the James Bond approach. If you watch the James Bond movies, right. all the first scene is James Bond doing great stuff. There's explosions. There's things happening. He wins, right. and then now you get into the the plot. Here's the actual story of what's going on. 
Yeah, and that that kind of, of hot and heavy start is a, is a very particular kind of start. It almost has nothing to do with the story. It's pure adrenaline, action driven, um, and it sets you up for a very very particular kind of story. Very 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 successful way to open things up. Um, so you you look at questions. I I want to talk about um, your character having a flaw. Uh, because your because your main character, the we talked about plot is what happens, mm -hmm. and story is why it matters to the main character, and uh, you go all the way back to, uh, of course I've lost it. So, so hero's journey really is a, a summary of the last two thousand years. You know, it goes back to Aristotle, the last two thousand years of writing, and the thing that the human brain is tracking is the flaw. It used to be called the wound, right? Um, flaw sounds sounds very judgy, and wound sounds a bit victim-y, which is why um, Lisa Cron, I taught in this course, I don't get any kickbacks, I don't, I don't work um, in this course anymore, but I taught that for a couple of years. Um, she calls it the character's misbelief. And I believe that that's really, really important because if you think about the fatal flaw, the character has a flaw, and every story, every story that you ever read, the character starts out here and they have one set of beliefs. They have some kind of flaw. And through the challenges, the plot pushes against that flaw and forces them to change. And by the end, when they're at point B, they have changed. If they've changed, you are in comedy or drama. And if they have not changed, if they still are the same as they were at the beginning and they haven't changed, you're in tragedy. So, so that's what the story piece of it is. And you have to work out what your character's flaw or wound or misbelief is. Uh, and the misbelief is always about the main protagonist. It's always an I am sentence. I am stupid. I am pointless. Um, you know, you think about Macbeth and Macbeth's was something, you know, it's about hubris. So it was like, I am invincible. And the old stories, I think that one of the reasons that they used to call, you know, the hero's wound, they were about, about royal characters and people who ruled. And so they, they tended to be about power and hubris. But now we're writing about ordinary people or cats in space. Um, but we're writing about a, a wide range of human experience, right? And, and the flaw that they're trying to overcome is something about surviving in social situations. So, so my personal flaw, I mean, I've got a billion, but the one that I, I fight against the most is um, my fundamental fear that I'm stupid. Uh, and it's a real fear. It's a real fear that I am actually stupid. And what that means is for someone who believes that they're stupid, so this goes way back. I think nature and nurture, when you think about the human brain, I'm very, very much about brain science. Um, so, so nature and nurture, we've become accustomed to what that means, nature and nurture. But nature means something is hardwired. And nurture, actually, although it sounds pretty soft and like something you can change, it's about what you are imprinted with. And think about how how big imprinting is. If you've ever tried to lose weight, my whole life, I look at your numbers and I am jealous, Craig. Um, I'm, I'm so, living it right now. <laughs> so, so you know how hard it is to change. And it's really hard to change your imprinting because, in fact, your brain has built a way to see the world. And most of the time, your brain is not seeing what's in front of you. So if you, if you read any of the brain science stuff, your brain builds a picture of what it remembers. It's pulling stuff up from memory. And there's a part of your brain that's scanning all the time for something new. And when it hits <coughs> something new, there is a part of the brain that becomes excited. And it's connected to the amygdala and the hippocampus. Fucking fuck. You told me not Sorry. So uh, the hippocampus <laughs> and the amygdala. And so it's to do with learning and memory. So when this part of the brain sees something new, it gets excited and you go into a state of excitation when you start remembering things and you get dopamine. Dopamine is being flooded into your brain. So you start remembering things as you set down new things in your brain. Just think about how that powerful, how powerful that is for a writer. 
So when your brain sees something new and when it sees something on the page, it cannot differentiate between what's on the page and what's in your room. They are both real to your brain. When yep. it sees something new, it becomes excited and starts remembering things. And the thing that lays it down in long-term memory is emotion. So when you've got fact linked to emotion, that's when you remember something, which is why you remember things like, um, you know, Christmases when you were young or the Seder that you had when, you know, your grandpa was there or big things that have heavy emotional impacts, they get laid down in your, in your mind. When you're writing your first chapter, you are using all of this brain science to, to put something that's familiar and then twist it and give us something new. And the brain knows. The brain absolutely scans to see something new all the time. And that something new uh, doesn't have to be bombs going off or guns going off. It's a character realizing something. It, 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 it doesn't? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, you, lost, <clears throat> you lost me there. Because I, well, I didn't go to Cambridge, so they, I'm sure they have an estimate about your uh, intelligence. But <laughs> Cambridge and, and Chelsea fans. But besides those, <laughs> okay. Um, so, so I, Lee, we do you, we do have some questions. If you're uh, okay, if you're okay, okay to take yes. a break, yeah, I am. I am. <clears throat> how, how do you know when you've signed on with the right developmental editor? Uh, so it's it's very very much about personality. You have to be you have to know what you need, and if you don't know what you need, you need to tell your developmental editor. I'm not entirely sure why this isn't working. I know it's not working, um, and you need to know whether or not you're a carrot or stick person. Um, I am very, very much about carrots. I am very, very much about rewards. Um, I recently saw there's a, a Pacific Northwest group of writers who get together, 20 books people who get together, and a couple of them set up a, um, a negative reward, which was if they didn't hit their word counts, they had to send a set amount, of, they agreed on, on the amount of money beforehand, and they had to send this money to a charity not of their choosing. So something that they were philosophically not aligned with. So it would be a punishment to send it. And they both made their word counts. That would never work for me. Never, 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 never work for me because I'm a carrot person. But yeah. they're clearly stick people. So you need to talk. And, and it's a very emotional thing. Finding a developmental editor and trusting them with your work, particularly if you're starting out um, and particularly if you don't trust yourself and you don't trust that you know what structure looks like. Um, and you, because because once you're at a certain place, like Craig knows this, I know this, uh, an editor gives you feedback and you're like, yes, yes, I get it. This helps. That's bullshit. No, that's not what I'm going for. And so you pick and choose with what your editor is suggesting to you. They are working for you. They are always working for you. So have a conversation, find out what their approach is, find out whether they're a Save the Cat person or they're a, a Joseph Campbell person um, or they're a Story Genius person. You know, what do they use as their template? How useful is that to you? What kind of feedback are they going to give you? Um, are they going to be able to tell you, you know what, you hit this pinch point and you missed it. You, you missed this moment or... Yeah, um, I'm going to talk about this next week in the third piece that I'm critiquing. So everything is there in this first chapter, but the emotion is jumbled. So it's going like this instead of building and building and building and building. And you want your developmental editor to be able to talk to you about, hey, this could be dynamite if what you did was you didn't, you know, you've got somebody walking into an alley and then everybody laughs and like, okay, now all the tension is gone. Why did you lose all the tension? Build on the tension. Do something else that's terrible. Have the storm break now, not five paragraphs from now. So talk to a developmental editor about what their approach is, what you need, what you want, and what you're trying to achieve. Um, coaches are slightly different. That You tend to work a little bit longer with a coach than you do with a developmental editor. And there are some great people out there. I mean, there are 20 books people who still do this. Jonas C still does this. Uh, Derek Murphy does this. Um, uh, Jocelyn Lindsay does this. So they're all people who are, are, are some kind of coach or developmental editor. And talk to them about what they do. Um, I, I don't know if it's considered cool or not to talk to any of their clients, but, but see whether or not they're up for that. Um, and, and just work out what you need. What do you need to learn? 
Um, have you committed yourself to learning? Are you, are you read deeply in your genre? Do you understand, you know, these building blocks go together like this for my genre, uh, not like this, which is what is for your genre. Um, I, I was listening to um, you and Lynn talking the other day and Lynn was saying that she wouldn't edit a romance piece. And I was thinking, oh, that's really, really interesting because I think that for structure in particular, for developmental editing in particular, you can, you can edit any genre. Um, but then it goes to personality. It absolutely goes to personality. I adore my editor, absolutely adore her, but it took me a long time to find her. And she's not really yeah. a developmental editor anymore, but I trust her. I tr trust her absolutely, and I believe she's on my side. Sorry, that was very rambly. Okay, yeah. And uh, another question. Um, what about starting your book in a flash from the past? Uh, okay, so it depends what the flash is. Uh, mostly, I would say no. Because that sounds like you're backing up for setup. Um, it used to be in traditional publishing, it used to be no backstory, no flashbacks for the first 50 pages. And I call bullshit on that. I don't think that's true anymore because I think you need context. Um, you begin in media res, and so you're going to be pinging into the past. You're going to be picking stuff up from the past. But beginning with a flashback means that we're not beginning in media res. And I would want to know why you are starting with a flashback. Um, if you are not starting as close as you possibly can to the inciting incident, and the inciting incident is what takes your character out of their comfort zone and forces them to act pretty much against their will, pretty much the way that structure works is for the first act, they really don't want to be doing this, but they have to do it because they've been pushed into it by the combination of the plot pressing on their misbelief. Um, so I would say, or I'm just going to pick a number out. I was going to swear. Um, I, I would say 95% of the time, uh, no, I would say do not start with a flashback, but you could be brilliantly accomplished and have a flashback <clears throat> that is, is so dazzling that we have to read on. Uh, I've almost never seen it. So, yeah. so I would say that that means that, you know, if you think about the ticking clock or how close you are to when things start going wrong and the brain is looking, scanning, scanning, scanning for when it goes wrong, that's when you engage. So if we're in the past, probably not. Yeah, probably. yeah. I, I, I've done that in, uh, in my uh, my thriller, which I, I got an incredible review from uh, from Mel Comley on, uh, on my People Rage book. And that's, uh, I, I use that in there. Uh, the main character has PTSD and mm. he'll devolve and he'll just sit and hold his head and things will happen. Mm -hmm. And then we'll mm -hmm. share what that flashback was, but there was an incident or something that, that triggered it. So those, those things, but starting off with one, no, no, I, I, I don't see that. I, the effectiveness of that, especially if you're a newer writer and I don't know, Facebook user, um, I, I don't know, uh, how accomplished you are, but that's, uh, Let's say it's little used uh, as an example. So, uh, so you, you, you said something very important, Craig. You said, you know, he, he goes into this PTSD state because he's triggered. So there's yeah. something in the present that triggers him into the past. And, and that's a, a craft tool is to know mm -hmm. how to trigger out to the past and back into the present. You want to spend most of your book in story present. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's the first time I use that is geez, like six, eight paragraph, eight chapters in. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. just as you, uh, as, as you uh, uh, get into it, um, we have a new question. How do you yeah. feel about starting a book with a conversation? <laughs> um, you know, depends on the conversation. Uh, yeah. I, I would say that, that you're starting your, your opening hook has to be the most interesting thing that they are saying. Remember that you're starting in media res, um, you are not building up to something. If you're using it to lay the groundwork and if you're using it to tell us about the character and if you're using us to tell us about place, you've lost. You've already lost. If, if you say, someone just handed me a grenade, what the fuck? Maybe, maybe we're in. You know, maybe that's the conversation we'll be in for because we've got an yeah. image and we've got action. But if you're building to something, you've lost us. Yeah, I uh, my my first book in the in the series for the the chapter that I read today, the first two sentences are conversation of the whole series. The first sentence is ass, a conversation. The second sentence is ass, 
the man uh, called the cat or whatever. So he's talking to his cat. That was the cat talking first, calling the man an ass. So, th so it's they a, would, of course, right? Of, co of course, even on a good day, uh, or, or or after just being fed. <clears throat> um, um, when we were in Bali, I uh, I spent the whole conference helping and and making sure that the conference went off. But then the last day, you guys uh, enticed me to come down to the pool and hang out with uh, you and, and Elaine, and and there was much beer, and and you had you had like a billion rupees uh, laying on the table. It was impressive. It was an impressive stack of money. Um, eight dollars and seventeen cents worth. No, it was actually like five thousand dollars worth. It was insane. Um, oops, missed the, missed that extra zero at the ATM. Um, so so uh, Elaine Elaine has a question. Can you give us common bad examples of misbelief? Um, so I I don't think there's anything there's any such thing as a bad misbelief if they get misbelief wrong. Um, but getting so so Lisa, who wrote Story Genius, she uh, she says, oh, it can take you months to work out what the misbelief for your main protagonist is. Um, I'm like, months, really? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> a couple of books. I, 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 um, I gave this 10 minutes in my plotting schedule, so let's get her figured out in 10 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I don't believe that. But but you have to think about um, about what the misbelief has to do with your story because the misbelief is going to force that character to act against this plot. So, so let's say that you and I uh, have two different misbeliefs and an event happens, right? And that event makes me do something. So, so I am afraid at a fundamental level, I'm afraid that I'm stupid. Uh, and somebody says, that paragraph's a piece of shit. And I'll be like, you're right, you're right, you're absolutely right. Oh my God, what shall I do? I better rip it up and write it 72 times, you know, which I did 10 minutes. Um, and, and your misbelief is, is something entirely different. Your misbelief is, um, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I have absolutely no idea. But let's, let's say not you, because that's too personal. <clears throat> let's say your main protagonist. Your main protagonist thinks their misbelief is, I'm unlovable, right? Uh, yes. So completely different misbelief. And if something happens in, in that, character's life that is or the paragraph you just wrote is a piece of shit they'd be like who are you fuck off that doesn't mean anything because it doesn't have anything to do with their misbelief it doesn't touch it right so your misbelief has to be connected to your plot and and each time your character makes a decision because they are learning how to overcome something um so so the only bad misbelief would be something that doesn't have anything to do with your novel um, yeah. and it has nothing to do with your theme and has nothing to do with your message. And I know it's very, very unpopular at the moment to say that novels have messages, but they do. Um, I was thinking about this at three o'clock this morning because I don't sleep very much either. Um, but but, uh, but we, we all write from our preconceptions. We all write from uh, the base of what we believe. I, I don't know, Craig, tell me if I'm wrong, but, but you have a personal code that has to do with um, honour and doing right with by people um, and stepping up and doing something that counts. And that's all part of your um, personal ethos. I bet that's in your books. I bet that, that, that there, there are stories about valor and stories about people who have to step up and stories um, who, about people who somehow weasel around that and who find a way not to do the right thing. Or I saw a post that you made the other day about I can't stand bureaucrats. I'm like, oh, that has to do, that has absolutely to do with his core beliefs about doing the right thing and doing it and doing it now and doing it right. So, so your, your belief system goes into your books and the only bad misbelief could be, oh, that was in the wrong book. That was just yeah. a different thing. Um, well, and, and misbelief, yeah. I, I would, I would also suggest that a uh, bad misbelief is, is how you work them. So you, you use the example of I'm unlovable. Well, in the first chapter, he's got these doubts. He's unlovable and he's concerned. Yet in the whole book, people worship him. You have to feed that doubt somehow. Like somebody turned up their nose and walked away. See, it's because I'm unlovable. It's not. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to feed that doubt somehow in order to keep it going forward in not, hey, you get to the second chapter and he's adored and people cheer when he shows up. Oh, I'm unlovable. What? Shut up. You're an idiot is what you are. And, and so you, you have to make sure that the uh, the misbelief 
is is fed somehow. So it keeps that you have to keep some kind of tension. You can't remove all the tension in the second chapter. Otherwise, uh, they all they, they leave and go on and move on. And the problem when so people leave. Cause and effect trajectory, right? Yep. Yep. Maintain the trajectory. Yeah. Cool. Uh, cool terms that you spent a, a whole year uh, learning, <laughs> but, that, but but they apply, but they're, they're the right ones. And somebody asked about uh, rising tension at the end, a question. Mm. I, I would call that an open loop at the end of each chapter. What you want to do is you want to keep the uh, keep them turning that page. You, My goal with a book, just despite that I'm writing longer and longer books, my last two were 82,000 words and 76,000 words, is I want them to read the book in one sitting. That's, that is my ultimate goal. And that was what Michael Anderle decided too. He's like, I want people, if they can read my book in one sitting, then they're going to be waiting for the next book and, and ready to move on. But if they put the book so, down, if you give them a reason to put the book down, they may never pick it back up again. Yeah. Closing hook. Every single time, closing hook. So, so you're setting things up, opening hook, question asked, question answered, rising tension, cause and effect trajectory, and so, and so, and so. Let me read you the end of this uh, first chapter and tell you what I cut um, as an editor. In less time than it took for a full breath, a huge force bore down on her from behind. Then a hand on her mouth, an arm around her wrist, a waist, and her body lifted up off the ground. Instead of darkness and danger, which she expected from the man whisking her out of the alley, all she sensed was annoyance. So she, she neutered the end of this, right? So she ends on an arm around her waist and her body lifted off the ground. Stop. Don't go to instead of darkness and danger, all she sensed was annoyance. Because now we're not in danger anymore. So well, and also that's a, that that's a, chapter. that's a, what author projecting. That's a, you're just you're telling the reader what they should feel. <laughs> yes. So yes. that's yeah yeah that's yeah whole another hour on what you shouldn't do as an author. Don't tell them here's the result of that action. You don't need to if you just described it well as as that paragraph did. So that was a good call. You take the and there's still enough tension there enough open well what are you going to do from here and right. and to to go into the next chapter yep i like it holy cow it's been almost an hour let's see if we got Yay. another uh, question or two <laughs> let's see people have commented and make sure that uh, uh they got the books right that you showed and and they have I love sweary Kate. That was from Elaine. <laughs> okay, here's here's one. I'm a, I'm a fan of cozy mysteries. Do you think protagonists in cozy mysteries have obvious to the reader flaws, or is it something more that the author gives to the character and doesn't show obviously in the storyline? Gosh, that's an interesting question. Um, so they have to have a flaw. Uh, otherwise, what are they learning? I mean, this is a very interesting question about series and whether or not the misbelief changes um, when you go from one book to another book or one. So, so Father Brown is a great example of a cozy mystery. Um, you're always learning something new. Each episode, you're learning something new about the character um, and you're learning something about them learning about the world. So I, I think that they do have to have a flaw they do have to be learning something. There has to be a misbelief, even in a cozy, even in something as gentle as a cozy. If there's no misbelief, then they're not on that character arc. They're not learning anything. And if they're not learning anything, it's an anecdote and it's not a novel. There you go. There you go. The final words of wisdom from Kate Pickford. Hang on just a second. Let me show that. There we are. <clears throat> um, I really appreciate you coming on, Kate. Uh, you've got a lot of experience. Uh, you've worked with a lot of novelists and your own novels. You're now able to critically look at your own novels, and you're not stupid by any measure of the imagination. You're probably the exact opposite. Uh, I, I expect you have an extremely high IQ because you engage. You can see how you love the story, and I bet you that shows through in your stories and your engagement once you got out of your own way, as you said. Learn what you need to do lay it out there, do it, and then get some neutral feedback. And you've got with your, your co-author, and I do know that relationship, uh, 
that has helped immensely, I should hope, to bolster your confidence that you write great stories, that you write stories people want to read and that they're willing to pay for, most importantly, as a, especially in this business of self-publishing. That is the single thing that you have to do as especially in 20 books of 50k because it's hard to get the 50k without people paying for the 20 books so uh the uh, your, your retirement plan is funded with good books this series i think is on track to uh, i thought at first it was on track to make about 250k but i think it'll make close to 300 300 yeah that's my best series i think is up to three 350 for uh, earnings, uh, climbing towards half a mil. My, my goal is I want to sell a million books. I haven't sold a million books yet. So that's, uh, well, and that's, uh, uh, yeah, I, I will. I, I, I have no doubt. Just how long will it take? <clears throat> we'll see. We'll keep putting out the, as good or as goodest books we can do. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. Go, uh, go tend to your, go tend to your dogs. They're, uh, they're probably waiting, loving on you for the second you leave. We really appreciate your time, Kate. Thank you very much. And let us know what you do with the videos, and we'll make sure that everybody knows where those are for your developmental videos. Really appreciate you coming on. I know that's not you're not uh, the biggest fan of, uh, of uh, being publicized and being on screen, but you're doing a great favor. Uh, you're so kind and generous. We, we, uh, we appreciate it, and I know everybody does as well who listened in. So tomorrow... Uh, we have uh, uh, another guest. All right. You guys have a great day and uh, everybody be cool. Bye, man.